Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to our last workshop for this quarter. Um, your, if you made it through the entire workshop, congratulations. Your prize is knowledge. <laughs> but uh, for real though, like if you stuck through the entire workshop and if you do some leak code practice, I think you'd be in really good shape for recruiting season in fall next year. So um, yeah, congratulations. Today's workshop is about trees and graphs. And uh, before we start, uh, just wanted to ask how familiar you guys are with trees and graphs. So yeah, just fill out the poll question. Okay, cool. So it looks like everyone is somewhat familiar. That's good. Um, today's attendance code. Wait, Anna, this is today's attendance code, right? Yep, yep. Okay, yeah. Today's attendance code is hire me, please. Um, I'll give you like five to ten seconds. Okay. And today's uh slides can be available at this link. I think Arjun put them in the put the link in the chat so you can use that link. But today we'll be talking about graphs first. I will be talking about what they are and the two main graph traversal algorithms, breadth first search and depth first search. And then we'll be talking about trees, which I think you guys might have more familiarity with because of CS32. But still we'll be going over the terminology with trees, what binary trees are and binary search trees and then the tree traversal algorithms. And then finally, we'll be going over example problems. Okay, so graphs. So graphs are basically a set of objects with associations between them. And those objects are called nodes and the associations are called edges. And they look like this in a, like a picture form. And this graph can be used to represent many systems. So an example of a system is like a social graph. And in a social graph, you would uh, use a node to represent a person and use an edge to represent a relationship between the two people. So for example, if I use one, sorry, one second. If I use the node one to represent me and the node two to represent Arjun, an edge between us would mean that we're friends. Um, and it can also be used to represent other systems. It can be used to represent like, for example, streets. I remember when I took CS32, we had to represent all the streets in Westwood as a graph. So we represented intersections as nodes in the graph and streets as edges connecting the intersections. Um, the graphs that we're talking about currently are called undirected and unweighted graphs, but graphs can also be directed and weighted. So directed just means that the edges are arrows instead of lines. And the arrows mean that the relationship is uh, in a single direction. So if I was zero and Arjun was four, an arrow from me to Arjun would mean that maybe I'm his friend. But if there's no arrow back, that would mean that Arjun's not my friend. And a weighted edge is one, is like a quantity associated with the, uh, like the edge. So in a direct, in like, a graph representing streets, the weight could be the length of the street or how much traffic there is on the street. And it's just represented by a number next to the edge. So graphs look somewhat complicated, but how would you represent this graph in your program? So I think like the most obvious way to me would be to represent each node as some kind of structure and then have like next pointers to all of the nodes that it's connected to, similar to a linked list. But I think uh, this implementation or this way of representing it is not too great because you can't really get like a sense of the entire graph. And in the case of a directed graph, sometimes once you go to the next node, you'll lose information about the previous nodes. So I think this kind of representation is only used for trees and binary trees specifically. In general, you want to stick to either adjacency lists or adjacency matrices. So here we have an example of what an adjacency list is. 
And it's basically just a list of what each node is connected to. So here we have like a list of every single node in the graph. And then for each node, we have a list of the nodes it's connected to. So in the graph, A is connected to B, C, and D. So in the adjacency list, A will be in the list for, adjacent, for A, we will have B, C, and D. And similarly for B, we will have A, E, and F in its list right here. So uh, one thing to notice here is that if you have a relationship between A and B, an edge between them, you have to put that in two times to the adjacency list. So once you have to put B into the list for A, and the second time you have to put A in the list for B. So adjacency lists are the preferred way of doing, of representing the graph, because they give you a slight advantage in time complexity when you're doing uh, the BFS or DFS. But adjacency matrix is also another way to do it, and it's used in other applications. It's basically the same thing as an adjacency list, except instead of having like a list of variable length, you have a list of size n, where n is the number of nodes, and then you just like mark the nodes where there's like an edge. So if there's like an edge between a and b, you would put like true in the entry for a to b, something like that. So graph traversal algorithms are ways of exploring the nodes in the graph. And there are two main ones. There's breadth first search and depth first search. And then there's a third more niche one called breadth first search. Okay, I'm kidding. But breadth first search is a way of exploring the nodes where you explore each path little by little. So you're kind of exploring each path, all the paths simultaneously. And depth first search is where you explore one path all the way until you hit a dead end. And then once you hit a dead end, you backtrack and explore the next path all the way. So this is kind of like an overview, but uh, specifically we'll be talking about breadth first search first. So let's say we wanna do like a breadth first search of this graph. And usually you wanna start at some start node. So here we have the instructions for starting at node one. So what you wanna do here is from the start node, you look at what are all your options to which edges can you move to from one. So we can go to five or two from one, and we would consider this to be our first layer. And in the next step of BFS, we would look at where can we move from our first layer. We can move to four from five, we can move to three from two. Um, so we would say that four and three are our second layer. Also notice here that two and five are connected to each other. So technically we could go from five to two, but we don't include two and five in our second layer because we've already visited them. So basically we don't explore nodes we've already seen. Okay, so, so far five and two were our first layer, four and three were our second layer. And then we look at what we can reach from four and three and that's six. So we would add six to our third layer. And so from this graph, we get this BFS tree that looks like this. We have five and two in the first layer three and four in the second layer, and then six in the third layer. Um, is there anything in the chat? Can you guys let me know? Okay, cool. So uh, that's what BFS does overall, but to implement it in code, we usually do so by keeping track of two things. The nodes that we have yet to explore in a queue and a visited set, which is basically just um, the set of nodes that we've already seen so that we don't explore them again. So the way that I would do a BFS in code would be to first add the first node to our queue because that's a node we have yet to explore. And then I look at the queue and pick the first item, which is the first node. And then I move that node to the visited set and I add its children to the end of the queue. So I'd add five and two, which are the children of one to the end of the queue. And basically I continue this process where I add the nodes I have yet to explore to the end of the queue. And as I explore the nodes, I add them to the visited set so that I don't explore them again. And one thing to make sure you do is that when you add a node to the end of the queue, you wanna make sure that you haven't already visited it. So make sure you check the visited set first. 
So this is kind of like the way that I would go about doing it. First, I would check one, add it to the visited set, add as children five and two. Then I would pick five, add it to the visited set, pick its child four and add it to the end of the queue. Then I would pick two, add it to the visited set, find its child, which is three, add it to the end of the queue and keep going until I reach six. And then at six, I have no children, which I haven't already explored. So then I'll end my BFFs. So this is how I implement it in code. Um, just going through the pseudocode, first I would add the start node to the queue. And then while the queue is not empty, I take the first item of the queue, which in the beginning will be the starter node. And then I remove that from the queue. And then I go through the children for that node and check if they are not in the visited set. And if they're not in the visited set, I add them to the end of the queue and add them to the visited set. So this is just how I would write it in C code. And by processing a node, I just mean whatever you wanna do with the node, it depends kind of on your application. Here, I'm just adding it to this vector called order, but maybe you wanna like do something special in your program. So BFS, uh, why would you use BFS, right? So BFS finds the shortest path from a single source, the start node, to all the other nodes in the graph. And this is this only applies to undirected graphs. Sorry, this applies to directed graphs also. I should correct this. It does not apply to weighted graphs. Um, so like I remember in one of my interviews, I was given like a problem where there was like this puzzle and I had to solve the puzzle in like the smallest number of moves every time. And so initially this seemed like really complicated to me because like there were many possible moves, but a really simple solution to this problem is just to do a BFS. And that means I just consider like every single move. And once I reach the solution, I know that that's the shortest path because BFS gives me the shortest path. So basically you can use the shortest path property of BFS in different contexts. And also BFS lets you find the connected component, which basically just means the set of nodes that are reachable from a specific node. Okay, so our next graph traversal algorithm is DFS. So whereas BFS kind of looks at all possibilities um, from a node, DFS first looks at only one. So an example DFS of this graph starting at one would be to just pick one of its children and follow that all the way through. So here um, I chose to pick two and then I pick three and then four and six. So you basically follow a path all the way through until you reach a dead end. And that means like no children of six that we haven't already visited. And then you backtrack. So you go back to the previous node and see if there's any children that you have you uh, have yet to visit. Um, just uh, ignore this edge for now. So let's say there's nothing at four, there's nothing at three, there's nothing at two, and then you go back to one, and then you realize there's an edge here, five. So then you consider five at this point. So this is what the DFS tree would look like. First, you go from one to two, to three, to four, to six, and then you backtrack, and then you add five at one. So DFS implementation. DFS implementation, I would say, is a little bit easier because you can use recursion. Um, so the way it works is that you have this function called DFS, which takes a node. And initially, you'll give it the start node. And then you process that node however you want. And then you look at all the children of that node. And if there are any children that are not invisited, you call DFS on that child. And before you call DFS, make sure to add them to the visited set. So here in this implementation, I'm making, I'm basically using like the internal stack of your program, but you can also implement DFS exactly the same way as BFS, but just substitute the queue for a stack. And I think Bill went over this last time. He kind of had a similar problem. So DFS 
is easier to implement. So that's why I would recommend using it if you could use either one. And some like special use cases are flood fill, which I think you'll see today in one of the example problems. It's also used in cycle detection and topological sort and some other algorithms. Okay, so next we have trees. So trees are just a subset of graphs and they are directed acyclic graphs. So directed, I think you're familiar with, but acyclic just means that the graph does not have any cycles. So you can't start at some node, use a sequence of edges and reach the same node. If you could do that, it wouldn't be a tree. And uh, trees, you might see them a lot, very commonly in CS because they represent like a hierarchical structure. So um, I remember when I first took like AP computer science in high school, um, they represented like inheritance, like class inheritance using a tree. Some other examples are your file system, which is a tree where, where folders are like nodes with children and files are like leaf nodes. Um, you can also have your course requisites represented as a tree and your course requisites can't have a cycle in it because then you could never complete your courses. And um, an example I have here is choices in tic-tac-toe. You could represent that as a tree because X can move either here, here, or here. And then O can move somewhere else. And you can represent the choices as like new nodes in the tree. So yeah, I think I've been using like the terminology already, but I think it's useful to go over the terminology before we go through the rest of the trees lecture. So a node is a single element in the tree. Uh, so it can be like any of these elements. And the root is the first, the topmost node, which is eight in this tree. Uh, children means the nodes that are beneath a single node. So like three and 10 are children of eight. And parent is the opposite. So parent, eight is a parent of three, eight is a parent of 10. Siblings are nodes that share the same parent. So three and 10 are siblings. And depth means the number of edges from the root to a specific node. So like the depth of this node six would be two. Height is the characteristic of the entire tree and it's the depth of the deepest node. So I think the deepest node here would be four, seven or 13 and they all have a depth of three. So the height of the tree is three. A leaf is a node with no children. So one, four, seven, 13 are all leaves. And subtree is a tree that's rooted at a node that is not the root of the entire tree. So like there could be a subtree starting at three, a subtree starting at 10, subtree starting at six, so on. Binary trees are a subset of trees which have only two children or at max two children. Um, I think you guys must have some experience with this from CS32. And binary search trees are a special kind of binary tree. Uh, binary search trees are like used to implement like sets and maps in C++. But basically it's a tree where um, every node's value in the left subtree is less than the root and every node's value in the right subtree is greater than the root. And also that the left and the right subtrees are binary search trees themselves. Um, it's useful to like remember these rules because I remember seeing a problem on leak code where you had to validate if a binary search tree is valid. Um, but basically, um, like I think in the arrays workshop, I think we told you guys that arrays are really good at accesses but bad at insertion and deletion. And then linked lists are good at insertion and deletion, but bad at accesses. But binary trees are like a good compromise between both. They give you like login across the board, but one caveat is that your binary search tree must be balanced. And there are some balancing algorithms or like self-balancing binary trees. I think the main ones are like ABL trees or red black trees. So uh, like for all the tree problems that you might see, I think the key to most of them is recursing on the subtrees. So what that means is you assume that you know the solution to the problem on the subtrees 
and you use that to construct the solution to the bigger tree. So an example of this is trying to sum up all the nodes in the binary tree. So summing up all the values of the nodes. So what you could do here is assume that you have the sum of the subtree at rooted at three and assume you have the sum of this subtree. And then you would sum up the sum of the left, the sum of the right and eight to find the sum of the entire tree. And your recursion would handle finding the sum of the subtree. And you could kind of build up your solution that way. And also just remember to, you know, consider your base cases, write code for them. But that's basically the idea, recurse on the subtrees. And tree traversals are similar to graph traversals. So breadth first search uh, is also called level order traversal in this case, but it's like the same implementation. And depth first search has three like names to them depending on how you implement it. I think you went, you guys must have went over this in CS32, but uh, there's pre-order traversal, in-order traversal, and post-order traversal. And um, something useful about in-order traversal is that if you do it on a binary search tree, it'll give you a sorted list. Okay, so that was a lot of talking. So let's take a break for a little bit for about two minutes, and then we'll go over some example problems. And also, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to talk in the chat or unmute yourself. I think we'll start at like 725, 27. Okay, so our first example problem is symmetric tree. And basically we're given a binary tree and we wanna determine if it is symmetric, which basically means like the left, it reads the same left to left to right and right to left. Um, so this is an example of a symmetric tree where you would return true. And this is an example of somewhere you would return false because it doesn't look symmetric visually. And uh, you can use this definition of tree node. And uh, I think we'll give you like a few minutes in breakout rooms to try to solve it. I think five to seven minutes. And then we'll come back and talk about it. And, uh, um, Okay, I saw some really great ideas for everyone. I think people were talking about in order traversal, level order traversal. And I think both of those can be used to make solution to this problem. Uh, when I saw this problem though, I thought of another solution. And I think that can be like a little bit easier to code up, especially in an interview scenario. But basically it uses recursion on subtrees. So, okay, let's see here. So let's say we're looking at this tree, right? So uh, symmetric, if we're trying to find out if this tree is symmetric, the number in the middle doesn't really matter. It could be anything because it's in the middle. So basically we don't care about this one. What we do care about though is, is this subtree a mirror image of this one? So like if we read it from left to right, it's the same as the right one read from right to left, right? So I think like a way to do that would be to first compare the twos and check if they're the same. And if they are, then we check if the outer subtree is a mirror image of this one, the other outer one. And if the two inner subtrees are mirror images of each other. So basically we reduced the problem of comparing this one to this one to just being a simple comparison between these two and then being a comparison between the outer smaller subtrees and the inner smaller subtrees. So that's basically the idea of like the code that I'll write. And you can see that in the example where it's supposed to be false, we would compare two to each other. And then we would try to compare three to null and that would be false because they're not the same. Okay, so let's head over to Replit.
And uh, I'll do it in this function called isometric. So basically we're given like a root in this function, a tree node pointer. And uh, we wanna check, basically we're given a tree like so, but we don't care about the middle element. We just wanna compare this one. We wanna compare if this one is a mirror of this one. So I'll make like a helper function that does that. So I'll call it is mirror. And it's gonna take a left subtree. tree. I'll call that R1 and a right subtree. R2. So first we wanna check if um, the two elements at the top of the subtrees are the same. So basically we're comparing the twos. So I'll define a variable for that called compare roots. And that's gonna be if R1's data is the same as R2's data. And then the next thing we wanna do is compare the outer two subtrees to see if they're a mirror image of each other. So I'll call this outer check. And this is is mirror on R1 left and R2 is right. So if we go back to the picture, if this is R1 and this is R2, then you wanna compare R1's left to R2 is right. And then we wanna check the inner one. So I'll define a variable called inner check. And that will be is mirror of the two remaining ones. So R1's right and R2's left. And then what we return is that all of these are true. So where you can just do an and. Okay, so that looks good to me, but we are not done yet because we forgot to consider our base cases. So the base cases I think would be when one of them is null. So let's go back to the example. So let's say we're checking the subtree at three and the subtree at uh, the outer subtree basically. And then they're gonna call an outer check on themselves, right? So we're gonna be comparing null to null. So if we have two nulls, I think that should be true. But if we have like a three and a null, so basically that they're both, one of them is null, we return false. So if both are null, we return true. If one of them is null, we return false. So if R1 is null and R2 is null, we return true. And then if one of them is null, will return false. Okay, so I think uh, this is like our helper function and it looks good to me so far. So how would we use this in our main function? Well, so I think there's like a small case here. We could be given a, just an null pointer. And if we're given an null pointer, I think we'll return true, but this would be like a good question to ask your interviewer. I think it makes sense to return true though. So I'll say if root is null, then return true. Otherwise we'll return the is mirror. So return is mirror of roots left to so the left subtree and root right.
Okay, and then let's see if this compiles. Okay, and I think testing this is a little bit annoying. So I wrote the test case in advance. I'll just copy and paste it. But basically I'm just testing the same one as on the slides. So let's see what we get. Okay, so we're getting one, which is true. And let's also test when it's false. So we just tested this one and let's test the second one. Okay, yeah, we get false in this case. So I think it's good so far. Um, do you guys have any questions? Okay, if not, we can add to the next problem. Oh, wait, uh, to quick, the time and space complexity. Oh, right, right, okay. So um, basically we call is mirror on with, um, so I basically, I think uh, we basically consider each node only once. So I think this would end up being O of N where N is the number of nodes. And for space, I think we don't really use any other space than what is required on the stack. So I guess if you ignore the stack, it's constant space. But if you do count the stack, it's like log N. Okay. So let's head to the next question, which I think Arjun will do. Oh yeah, before we do that, poll. Okay, cool. Okay, so our next question. Okay, so this question is converting a binary search tree into a sorted list. Um, just, just a refresher, a binary search tree is a tree where you're guaranteed that every element in the left subtree is strictly less than the element itself. Um, every mirror, uh, sorry, oof. <laughs> every element in the right subtree is greater than the element that you're currently at, and the left and right subtrees are both binary search trees. Um, so if we kind of think about it in in the input example that we're given for um, four every element in the left subtree is less than it, every element in the right subtree is less than it, and the subtree is a binary search tree because uh, for two, one is less than it, three is greater than it. Um, so is that kind of description of a binary search tree clear? Okay, so now we want to get the, the binary search tree and we want to convert it into a sorted list. And, and that's, fairly critical to note here. Um, so since we want the list to be sorted, can we just like slap on any old traversal and just like get a list and get out of here? Or is there a particular traversal we could think about um, so that maybe this conversion to a sorted list is more, more natural? I'll give, I'll give you a hint. We want the elements. Okay, we could use DFS. That should uh, should work. Um, any particular traversal, like maybe post order, pre order, in order. Yes. So we want the elements to be in order. 
for our list since it's sorted. And so an in-order traversal um, may make sense. And I think um, the decursive solution for this is um, super clean. So I think we'll um, jump onto the REPL before that. Are there any clarifying questions you'd like to ask a potential interviewer if you're given this question? Okay, no worries. Um, I, th I think like with questions like with uh, questions like this, standard um, questions are usually, well, is, what, what what should I do if I'm given an empty uh, tree or something like that? And if you if you have no tree, just like I don't know, don't do anything. It's like if if there are no trees, we'd all be dead. Um, because hashtag save the rainforests. But okay, so I think. We don't have any questions, so I think we can safely hop on to the uh, REPL and get started with the implementation. Wait, uh, screen, sh screen shader. All right, so since there are no more questions, we can safely hop on to the REPL and get started. Um, I have this function called BSD to list. I, okay, good, you can see my cursor. And um, we're going to assume this definition of a list node, uh, each um, throwback to the linked list session, each uh, node has an int value, it has a pointer to the next node, and it also has this little constructor that'll make constructing a new list uh, nice and intuitive. Uh, similarly for the trees, um, what I've done is declared our um, the the list that we wanted to turn as a global. That, that was a little little cheeky of me, but but um, in in general, you'd want to just like keep this parameter and pass it around as another uh, argument in your functions. Although you can this this is kind of a easy way out of doing that. Okay, so we're given this function bsd to list. Um, I've also declared this helper function called process node that's going to take a value of a node and um, generate a linked list node from a tree node and then uh, add it to our global list. Um, but we'll, we'll figure out this implementation later. For now, we'll just assume that it works and, and, and is all um, and, and everything is fine. But okay, so we'll start off implementing BST to list. And um, our first thing is we want to check if our node is null. And since we're going to be doing a lot of dereferencing here, we want to make sure that we're never, um, we're never uh, dereferencing any null pointers. So if D is null, we just want to return. Um, okay. And otherwise, so now we've uh, ended our base cases. And now since we're doing an in-order traversal, um, what order do we go in? Like, uh, do we go right, center, left? Do we go center, left, right? Or do we go left, center, right? Okay, so I'm just gonna pseudocode this out real quick. What we want to do first is process left subtree. Yes, left, center, right is correct then do something with the current node. And then process right subtree. And is that intuition clear? Because this ordering is defined or sort of derives from the fact that we're using a binary search tree, which means every element in the left subtree is lower than the current element. Every element in the right subtree is greater than the current element. And so if we want to get stuff in order, it makes intuitive sense to go left, then the current, and then right. Okay, so we want to process the left subtree and um, we want to process the left subtree and well, that's a tree because it's a subtree, it's a tree and it's something that we want to convert into a list. Uh, so why not just call the same function recursively? So I'm going to do that. So we're going to call BSD to list and we are going to pass tree node 
uh, sorry, T left. Okay, now with the current node, what I want to do is I want to have my function that I declared before add the node value to the list. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call, excuse me, I'm going to call process node on the current node. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to process the right subtree by doing the same thing except with right. Okay, so is this, is the function BSD to list clear? Like, is this kind of recursive stuff that we're doing here? Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, so now, um, now we're, 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 we, we can go to implement our helper function. And what this helper is going to do is it's going to take a node and it's going to, um, and it's going to basically add a node to the list. As always, when you're dealing with pointers and trees and lists and all of that, um, it's important to think about what it means when something when a pointer is null, and also what it means um, when, um, like how you're going to deal with it in the code. So, what if I call process node? on a null pointer, what does that mean? Um, it basically means that I've uh, bottomed out somewhere, like I've hit a leaf. So it's perfectly fine, no need to panic. If t is null, just return, get out of there. Uh, now, slightly more subtle and um, <laughs> the, I, using the word subtle like that is so pretentious, but I, I like to do it anyways. But what does it mean if um, the, the uh, what, if, what does it mean if list root is null? So what that means is that basically our list is empty. And so what we want to do is we want to add in um, the first node to our list. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a new node, I'm gonna call it ln, um, uh, and it's going to get a new list node, and the value for this node is going to be t uh, data. Okay, and there seems to be an error, no viable, ooh, should have caught that, but no worries. And I spelled the word list wrong. Okay. So we have this node and if list root is null, so if uh, list root is the null pointer, what we want to do is we want to simply assign root to be um, the value that we just got because we want to start off our list, make a new beginning. Uh, so we're just going to set list root to be ln and we want to return because we don't want to do the rest of the stuff in this function. Okay, so if we, um, so if we reach this block, basically it means that the node we're at is not null, so we haven't bottomed out or anything, and it means that um, list root is not null, so we have something in our list. And um, what we'll do is we'll add elements progressively to the back of the list. So that what that'll do is it'll make sure that um, our list is in ascending order when we get it, which is what we want. So what I'll do is I'll declare a new pointer to do this list traversal. I'll always good to uh, refresh those. So I'm going to declare this to, uh, current to be list root. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to traverse the list. So while current and there's another 
thing to notice here is that we want to reach the last node. So we want to make sure that current next is not null. So once current next is null, that means we're at the last node of the list. If we were to say while current is not null, we'd reach the end of the list, but we wouldn't have a way to keep track of that last node. So while current next is not null, keep going to keep setting current to current next. Okay, and once we're done, we're going to set current next to be ln. And then we can return, although this is not necessary for a void function. So is this process node function clear? What we're doing first is we're checking if the node we got is null, we bottom down return. If the list root is null, it means this is the first node we're adding to the list, simply assign it. Otherwise, what we want to do is we want to go all the way to the end of the list and add this new element there. Okay, so I think this implementation should be good. I'm going to scroll to the main um, and uncomment out my test case real quick. Okay, so we have this test case and we have a 10. Um, the right subtree is just the number 15. Then the 10, its left subtree is two and the two has one to its left and five to its right. Um, so again, the, since this is a binary search tree, the linked list that we get should just be a sorted list of one, two, five, 10, 15. Okay, so I'm going to run this. And we get one, two, five, 10, 15. Um, so this is a sorted list. We're almost done. Just a small thing to point out is the time complexity. Does, it, does anyone want to take a guess at the time complexity? OK, no worries. So um, what we're doing is Basically for each node, we're kind of doing some stuff. So I'm tempted to say O of N, but we have to be super careful that we are iterating to the end of the list on each iteration. So I think this is actually O of N squared because um, for each operation, we're performing another O of N operation. So there's a super, not super simple, I guess, but there's a small trick we could do to potentially reduce this time complexity. What we could do is instead of appending an element to the end of the list, we could append an element to the head of the list, which is a constant time operation since we're just kind of moving around some pointers. And then once we get that list, our final list would be, um, that would be uh, in the reverse order. So we could just reverse a linked list which is, so that would be O of N plus O of N, which is a net of um, O of N, because when you add stuff that uh, the, the largest term is still of order N. Um, again, space complexity, there's um, an additional data structure created. So that is O of N of extra space. And there's also, <laughs> the, quite frankly, the, the large number of stack frames that we create. So that's another thing to think about. Um, there's, there, there's, there's some improvements you could make to the solution. Specifically, could you do this maybe without the recursion and all of that stack overhead? Could we do it without creating a new linked list? Maybe seeing if we could do it in place, but that is left as an exercise to the watcher. Um, okay, so I think I'll end that. We can switch back to the slides and I will fire up the poll question. Okay, guys, after we answer the full question, this is the final question of the quarter. Thank you so much for sticking around. God, 
I, we got our trusted Lorenzo, Jennifer, uh, Tyler Funk's out here for once, uh, not to call him out, but, uh, and then thank you, Pratyusha, and also Mohinder, if I'm butchering your name, I'm so sorry. If you want to correct me, uh, feel free to do so right now as well. Thank you guys so much. And also thank you, I guess, Arjun is not here. Okay, so let's go over this question. Uh, territories. Okay, so we're going to be given a 2D map. As you can see here, we're going to be given a grid. It's going to be only positive integers. And what we're trying to do is basically, it's kind of like, have you guys seen the island question? Uh, if you've done code, I think that one's pretty famous. It's where you try to quantify how many islands there are uh, given like there's water. So like each separate island, but this is something similar, right? So um, a territory of N is a region of the map which you can connect by adjacent ends by horizontally or vertically. So we're not doing any diagonals. And note that a state can have multiple territories. So from here, we can see that, um, I guess you can't really see my cursor, I think, because uh, Sarthik's scaring. But like, uh, so I think if you want to just zoom over onto uh, the one. So the we have our three by two here, and then it's also connected to this like nice uh, right like triangle thing. Not really. It was also connected there. So that's one. And then the last one we have this like it's also three. So that's two in total. Um, it doesn't really matter. We could have said this uh, was zero and one, and then this would also give us two. So just note that like the number basically tells us like if. There can like if their neighbor is also the same number, then we would say it's this it's part of the same territory. And then on the right, we have uh, many territories here. So we have our two by two ones here, and then a almost three by three. We have a two by three, and then a two two by one. I don't one by two, and that just makes us that's another one. And then the one is alone by itself, all by myself. Obviously, cue the song. And then by itself, and then we have another two by two for twos, and plus that little lonesome two over there, and then also uh, one by two. Uh, so all this talking and numbering hopefully doesn't make you a little bit more confused. Uh, if you are confused on this question, feel free to unmute and ask it right now. And also, if you want to, you can type in a chat of like some edge cases that we should be following. To think of any. So in this case, um, what would you guys? If you saw this question, what method would you guys use to implement this? I think uh, it's definitely, I mean, the biggest hint I can give you is that is one of the methods that we discussed. And I think you guys discussed during class. So no worries if you can't find any, but uh, we'll probably just switch on to over to Replit, then uh, start coding away. Okay, let's see, let's see. So um, I guess I'll start right above me. Okay, so if you just like from 10 seconds ago, so what are we gonna be returning? We're gonna be returning the number of territories, right? So this would be eight. Let's just call it territories because we have no sense of creativity and then we'll be given our grid. So our grid is going to be a vector of vector and so this is a 2D um, integer, not, not 2D integer. This is a 2D int, um, what's it called, array. But we're just using vectors in this case. Oh, wait, there's already a territory here. Uh, OK, so this is going to be called grid. And that's the only thing we're going to be passing, right? Great. So what are we going to do next? So. We want to make sure that uh, we have our length in the width, right? So let's call length on this. So length equals like dot size, right? And then we have, we want the width. And how do we get the width? We would have to index into the 2D array and get like perhaps the first row. And then we can get the size of the first row and that would give us um, the, call, the call. Does that make sense? I guess in this case, it'll be the row size. Of the, yep, this, okay. So, what we do here is we would do zero, grid zero. 
And then we can just check if either of the length or the width is less than or equal to, what's it called? One, oh, no, less than one. And that means that you know we're dealing with either zero or lower than that. And I don't think you can have a negative size. size. Therefore, anything lower than one would be valid. Let's do L less than one or width less than one. Uh, early edge case. I'll put in one. Okay. And then in that case, we can probably just return zero, right? I always ask the interviewer, it's like, oh, should I return zero or should I return negative one? And I think in this case, zero will probably be your best bet after you ask them. Okay. So next up, what we're going to do is we're going to probably, now we have a 2D grid, right? So that means that we'll probably have to look at each individual grid. Um, point coordinate, if you say so. So in that case, what's the easiest way to iterate through an entire 2D array? Yes, of course. Okay, let's see. Let me do length. Now, what are we going to be doing inside here? So. I'm going to be running DFS, and obviously, you, usually you make a helper function called DFS and you just basically call it. So that's what I'll be doing in this case. But then let's think about this. So our grid is composed of numbers, uh, so like one, two, three, four, five, right? So we want to make sure that we're always getting, like when we're checking um, territories, they always have to have neighbors that are also the same number, right? In that case, it's kind of like, a color. So uh, I think Sarthik kind of dropped a hint uh, in like 30 minutes ago, but basically he said that it's, we're going to kind of be like color coding our 2D array. Um, always ask questions if you don't understand what I'm trying to say. Um, but basically, that's what we're, kind, we're um, going to be doing with this specific uh, what's it called? problem. So we're going to be checking if this specific, we're going to be kind of marking every spot that we check um, like invalid or visited in this case. So what I'm going to be doing is that I'm going to check if my specific coordinate is visited or like uh, negative one, I guess kind of in some ways it's invalid, but in this case, we're just saying it's visited, right? So. If we haven't, if we've seen it already and it's like, and we mark it as negative one, and we like, that means that, uh, what's it called? Oh, wait, if we mark the grid IJ is not equal to negative one, that means that uh, we, uh, that is like a kind of an original spot. Does that make sense? Or anybody have any questions? I can't actually see the chat. Yes, no. Oh, wait. Okay. Uh, so in that case, I cannot minimize zoom. Okay. So in that case, I want to be increasing the number of territories, right? So, oh, actually, I didn't even define territory. So in this case, we just call territories. Here. So if we find one that we haven't marked as negative one, that means that we're going to be increasing on that. So, and then we're going to be filling each uh, successive, uh, what's it called? Like neighbor that is also with the same number to negative one. So uh, in this case, let me define a different function. Uh, let's, it's not going to be returning anything, so let's say void, and then fill. And I'm going to be passing in our vector, vector, and then be passing it, reference, and then the specific, um, I want to say, uh, let's just call it the num, like the current number it holds, right? So, um, then I, which is the current x coordinate, and j. 
Does that make sense? I don't hear anything, so I think that's a yes. So we always want to check if the specific coordinate that we're checking is valid, right? So in this case, since we'll be checking its neighbors, we can always go out of bounds. So it could be we're checking one coordinate to the right, and then it's at the border. And then we would be accessing, uh, it would be memory, uh, what's it called? We would be accessing without memory, and therefore the compiler would throw an error on us. So we want to avoid that, right? So we can actually check if the specific coordinate is within bounds. So as long as it's within bounds, so if it's not, so it's less than zero, right? We can have zero. And if it's greater than or equal to the size of the grid, or the y coordinate is less than zero, the y coordinate actually, yeah, the y coordinate is greater than or equal to grid. And in my case, I think you can do either i or j, so you can just do i don't say. But it should be a square grid, so if you just do zero, I think it should be fine as well. So if you do get this, then we're going to immediately exit, right? We don't actually want to access any uh, of these coordinates because they would be out of bounds. Before we return. And then, so if this specific grid, like coordinate, matches up to the number that we gave it, that means that it's a neighbor, right? Or it's part of the same territory. Therefore, let's mark it invalid as like visited. So let's do i j equals negative one. Right, because our condition is that if it's not negative one, then we would increase count. So we would be kind of just saying we're just getting it one point and we're iterating through the entire um, grid anyway. So we would be checking over all of the coordinates regardless. So if we keep the original position that we filled from, then we would always have the number of final territories we, uh, we would have. Does that make sense? So in this case, we have to be checking all the neighbors uh, either above us, below us, left or right, right? Where there's no diagonals. So that makes us, our lives a little bit easier. We don't have to check the four corners as well. Uh, real oh. quick, there's a question in the chat. Yes. Or I can't see. What is the num parameter? So remember, each, uh, if you want to just show it, yeah. So each coordinate has a specific number that uh, kind of like represents it, right? So if all the ones are together, that's one territory. The threes are all together, three is a territory. Does that make sense? So basically, it's just the value of the grid or the original that we're trying to call it for. That's the same as grid IJ for the first one we pass in. So we're going to be passing it. In. And then we're going to be recursive, not recursively called. Yeah, we were kind of recursively calling. The, like, okay, so I'll make this a little bit more clear. So in this case, right, like what we're going to be doing is if the this grid ij in our territories function, if grid ij isn't equal to negative one, that means that we either haven't checked it. Well, in this case, we like we haven't checked it, right? So we're going to check it. And then that for sure means there's a territory. And then we're going to make all of the neighbors that have the same value of num equal to negative one. Therefore, like it's visited and we will never see it again. Does that make sense? Uh, I will take your silence as a yes, sorry. If you have a question, be sure to voice it again. Okay, for sure. So basically this just means that if grid is a negative one, we're not, we haven't seen it yet, we're going to visit it. And then we're going to mark all the neighbors as negative one, meaning that we visited it and we don't have to see it again. And by making sure of that, that means that all of the neighbors that we see with the same color or not color, the same num, that means that we'll be uh, like disregarding because we know it's part of that's the same territory. Okay, continue. 
sorry about that. Uh, we're going to just check all the positions, you know, top left, top left, right, down. Sorry, I got confused there. So we're going to be passing in our grid, and then we're also be passing in our specific number, right? Now, and then we're going to do I minus one, so this would be to the left, right? And then let's do to the right. Wait, no, this is above. Sorry, I minus one is above. I cannot need apparently. Okay, and then J plus one. What is J minus one? Does that make sense? It is mad at me. Why is it mad at me? Expected a open parentheses for function style cast. Uh, what am I missing? Huh. I don't actually see where I have an extra closing parentheses. Does anybody else see them? That is weird. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to give us an error. So let's see. I have my vector vectors correctly, int num, int i, uh, int j. Uh, maybe it's here. I don't think so. That is weird. <laughs> is there an extra uh, angle breaks after fill, open parens? Like right here, do you see my cursor? Extra one? Oh yeah, it is. I'm very dumb. Thank you. And also, I'm very dumb here because I accidentally did a one equal sign to a two equal sign. That would not be good. So in this case, our last step is to basically, you know, fill in our grid. So that specific number we're going to pass in, right? That's going to be our number that we're going to be referencing for every other neighbor that we're going to check for. And then this is the original coordinate we're checking against. And just to minimize time, I have test cases already, so we don't have to you know, make them during the tech, like in the technical interview, I'm hoping they would give it to you or like it would be pseudo coding it so you wouldn't have to do it in the first place. I'm just gonna this. So this is the exact same test cases that we did uh, for the example, as you can see here. So let's do territories, I can spell, grid two, what's the name to my right? I hope, do we have namespace? Yeah, we have namespace. Okay, and then let's call territories, I think that's good. Yep, okay. Excuse me, control has reached, so I'm guessing I'm missing a bracket. Oh, I'm having too many brackets. Ah, yes. What is the point of ret not returning something if uh, you're just not going to answer the question? Yep. <laughs> Okay, so our first one is two regions, as you can see here. And then we have five here. So uh, like our example. And does anyone have any questions? Okay, no questions. So we can pull and then I guess give our closing statements. Oh wait, big O? Big O, sorry. Okay, so can anybody tell me what big O is, this big O? Um, I think it's pretty evident, you know, from our uh, specific loop that I've done. So uh, anybody wanna 
bravely tell me what the time complexity is judging by this specific territories function. Going once, going twice. No, okay, it's okay. I'll tell you anyway. So it's n squared, right? We're going through the entire array. And if you want to be a little bit more specific, it's not always going to be a square array. So it's n times n. And we're iterating the entire thing. And we're checking, right? We're ha we have to check for every single coordinate to see if, like, you know, they could all, it could be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then like to 20. And each of them would be their own distinct island, and we can't actually fill anything. So in that case, we'd check everything regardless, right? So n squared. And then originally when I did this question, I did it with a, um, I did it with a separate data structure. Um, and I created a stack as well as a visited, um, what's it called, like vector vectors separately. And then our um, Sarthic solution just basically made more sense because you don't have to do that anymore for your space complexity, right? Like I didn't create any extraneous um, data structures or arrays in this case, and originally, and just modified in my original grid. And you can see here when I even call fulfill. If you weren't calling fill with the specific, um, what's it called, pass by reference, then you would be creating because C++ by, uh, by default creates it by value, right? So then you would be creating n squared number of copies of grid and they wouldn't be even a, like, uh, what's it called? They wouldn't, you wouldn't even get the good, correct answer because since it's going to be creating its own copy, the original grid's never gonna get modified anyway. So like, none of your like your if statement for if grid ij doesn't equal to one negative one is always just going to be right it's just going to give you probably n times n number of territories so that's just something to keep in mind of. so in this case space complexity that's a nice one we don't actually create anything extra but time complexity we have n squared and don't be scared of n squared like when i was interviewing someone they were like oh you know uh unfortunately but my time complexity is like n cubed or n squared. I was like, okay, well, that's like the best you can do. So I don't really know what you're worried about. Like, it's just, it's just it's sometimes like polynomial time. And I think uh, you'll learn this later on in 180, but polynomial, if you can solve something in polynomial time, it's good. Don't worry. Um, someone already probably solved it and it's faster, but like if you can solve it in polynomial time, it's good. Yep, yep. Okay. So I think you want to segue into 180. I'm going to relaunch the poll real quick. As, any, as long as it's not factorial time, you're, you're good. Or you can't even get factorial time, right? It's like, a, wait, which one's worse again? Two to the n or n? I think factorial is worse. I see. Nice. Alrighty, thank you for voting. Okay. okay, so like Anna said, <clears throat> that was the last problem of our workshop this quarter. And you guys have officially finished this quarter's workshop, so congratulations. So what can you do from here? Like, what should you do to become prepared for um, interviews next fall? So we have an advanced interview prep uh, workshop next quarter. So um, that would be like, you know, the next step in this series. So um, if you can, please come to that. We would also recommend taking CS180 because, uh, you know, it's like these workshops are not the equivalent of like a formal introduction to algorithms. And that's, I think really helpful in my opinion for interviews. And uh, so take that as soon as you can. I know like just signing up for the class can sometimes be hard. So if you can't get it like the first quarter you try, try the next quarter. And I think the most important thing you can do is just do a bunch of lead code. Just do like uh, the shortlisted questions, the easy questions, the medium questions for interviews. And if you're targeting a specific company, you can also do the questions for that company. And we still have mock interviews for a little bit. So please sign up for a mock interview if you want to try. Um, yeah, I think um, this is our feedback form. 
So uh, if you have any feedback for this workshop and the entire workshop in general, please give that to us. I think it would be pretty helpful for next quarter's workshop too. In case uh, like you wanna show up, we can actually incorporate what you want for the next workshop. And that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for coming guys. It's been, it's been a great And We're also willing to take questions as well. Cause it's the last, uh, if you have anything random as well. You have to be only interviewed. Also, I don't recommend taking 180 over winter. Right. Sure. Is this a Gaffney? Yeah, yeah. Is is he who must not like he who must not be named? What is the Harry Potter? <laughs> it's funny. Oh, we should probably stop recording when I said that. <laughs>